Right, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being on time. I guess things will go back to normal when I can start a class with more than 50% of the students and when fewer than 30% of the students will miss every class. I'm going to show you what I posted on the class website also to give you a sense of what is left for us. I'm going to show you how to schedule your oral presentation. If you want to present in front of me on Zoom instead of sending a video, discuss the calendar of the class, and then I'm going to do three things. I'm going to continue briefly with the introduction of chapters from the prints because I want to make sure that we make good progress and we finish the analysis of the prints by the last week. I'm going to talk about a famous play by Machiavelli called The Mandrake Root or The Mandrake and finally I'll briefly introduce the last Machiavellian text the New Machiavelli by H.G. Wells, more famous for his science fiction novels. As you see here, I added the lesson plans for um, any relevant link for the current week. This was Monday. Under B, you find the key points for today, including two presentations that I will use during my lectures. On Friday, we will switch from the BBC version of House of Cards to the more famous American version and watch scenes from at least one episode from the first season. At the end of this week, I added the new assignments the last chapters in the prints, all the way to the last one, and the last readings from a Machiavellian text. This time you have three set of excerpts. The new Machiavelli is a long and complex novel, so this was the list I could do to introduce the Machiavellian content and themes in the novel. Next week, there will be any pages from the prints or directly from the new Machiavelli. However, I will add at least one reading about the themes of Machiavellianism and anti-Machiavellianism in this particular novel. If you go to the announcements page, you will find an important announcement about the oral presentation. You know that the final grade includes an oral presentation that is based on the analysis of a book, the Machiavellian themes in one of the books selected from the page called Ideas and Suggestions for the Paper. I've decided this year to use this app, Calendly, so you simply, you don't have to have the app from any browser on your tablet, computer, your laptop, your phone. You just click on this link and there you have it. You have just this event that I created and of course it covers both this class and the class that I have after this one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which is CCS 395. So you click on this event, and then you find 10 possible days from Monday, May the 2nd, until Friday, May the 13th. Initially, in the first draft of the syllabus, I had limited the uh, schedule for presentations in this class to May 12th, I've extended it to May 13th, just in case, keep in mind that May 13th is also uh, the day for your final exam. And I'll review the calendar with you. 
Again, you can click on any of those days to see what time slots are available, right? And, and this is all coordinated with my agenda. So all the time that I have free in my agenda between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, can be seen in here at any time that is taken by someone who reserves a time slot or by, let's say, another meeting that I need to schedule is removed from the selection of times. And after you've explored your options and seen something that is compatible with your agenda, then you click on a time slot and when you click confirm, you'll be asked to provide your first and last name, your email, make sure you use your Stony Brook email. And if you need to add anything or if you need to share a link to a presentation in case you want me to review something, this is optional. This is not something you necessarily need to uh, do. And you can also add, if you want, your phone for reminder, and then you press schedule event. Once you do that, once you press schedule event, you will receive at the email that you put into the form, a message confirming the time of your scheduled presentation. And you should keep that message because from there, if you need to, you can cancel and reschedule your uh, presentation if you need to. Of course, if you lose that message, uh, you can go back to the system and start from scratch and select another time slot. However, in that case, I recommend that you also send me a message so that I can remove the duplicate time slot that you had selected before. What I mean is that you can add another time slot. You cannot yourself delete the original time slot from this form. You have to do it from the message you receive from the system. Daniel, question. I'm assuming you don't have to do this if you take a video, right? Exactly, okay. exactly. So I recommend that you present live in front of me and, and this makes it a little more interactive. Also gives you a chance to receive feedback, especially if you don't do it after the deadline of the paper, which is May 10th. And therefore, uh, I, I can provide suggestions on how to revise, expand, uh, make your paper uh, better. Also makes for a stronger presentation, right? You're there, you're the expert, you're able to uh, talk about your book, analyze, put on the screen examples, analyze them, right? And it's the, the grade for the presentation is not based on how formal, how perfect the delivery is, rather is on uh, your demonstration of the skills that you have, the analytical skills, the intellectual uh, knowledge that you have acquired on this particular topic. So your ability to uh, develop an argument about a book and say something about the main topic, which is to what extent this book was inspired by Machiavelli, to what extent does this book reflect Machiavellian ideas. And even though the paper contains a lot of other sections, don't include in your presentation a formal introduction uh, with uh, when the author was born, uh, when he died, if he died, or uh, their professional career, etc. Those things are not exactly relevant and your presentation is about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. So go straight to, if you need to have an introduction, it should be a summary, a short summary of the book, right? Or 
an idea of how the book is organized, right? Because different books will have different focal points or a different style, a different design altogether. And then the core of your presentation should be a show and tell. Show me passages and discuss those passages. Depending on the book, you might not have the kind of analysis that is connected to a single passage, in which case you might want to create a slide with a series of themes that you discuss or references to examples which are long and therefore you cannot show them but you can go through them, meaning example after example, and don't include too many, you summarize what's in the example. What is that the players or the characters in the example are doing, and then develop your Machiavellian analysis from there. And I try to model both approaches myself when on Wednesdays I was discussing Machiavellian books, introducing general themes, and then also discussing specific passages. That is what your presentation should be about, okay? So schedule your presentation as early as possible. And then if you need to, you can cancel, you can reschedule. And of course, if you want to record a video, upload it to Google Drive or, an, or another cloud platform, and then share the link with me, by, by the deadline, which would be the same, May 13th, uh, please do so. Make sure that your pre-recorded uh, presentation is not you reading notes, because that is not a presentation. You, you lose points if you're just reading instead of talking. And make sure you include the same kind of approach, show and tell, whereby you show passages, you show slides with references to themes, and you go through a discussion of those. Make it dynamic, okay? Make it convincing. It doesn't matter if you have to stop and gather your thoughts, make a pause, and then restart. You don't have to edit your presentation in, in, in any kind of complicated form, right? And as you know, I suggested, uh, you, you find that suggestion in the syllabus, that you use Zoom because through Stony Brook University, you have a Zoom license and you can use the recording feature in Zoom. Zoom will allow you to put on the screen the browser or PowerPoint or any other kind of app or software program where you have passages to analyze, talking points, and then also once you have that and you talk, you have yourself in a corner so that uh, I'll be able to see you, listen to you, and follow on the screen what you're discussing or analyzing, okay? But again, it's a suggestion, any kind of software you're familiar with, uh, you can uh, use. I wouldn't particularly recommend, for example, using PowerPoint though. It's more complicated to do. The end result is, is not as nice. Yes, you can go from slide to slide and listen to a commentary, but it's not as dynamic. Third option, if you want to, instead of presenting on Zoom, if you want to present in my office, let me know during that uh, week, during that period of time, and you can come during the office hours, so you can schedule another time when I'm on campus, and you can present in front of me. You can put a computer on the desk if you need to present anything, or you can put your talking points, your passages on a handout and share it with me. Whatever you feel more comfortable in terms of format. But again, try to get into the spirit of this presentation. It's not a formal presentation. It's showing what you've learned, right? Your active competence in reference to the analysis of a text that is presumed to be based on Machiavelli. Let me show you again the calendar. 
So May 6th will be the last lecture for this class. And then on May 10th, the paper is due. Now, keep in mind that the paper should be placed inside the same Google Docs file that you shared with me, where you placed the couple of assignments that uh, were assigned during the first part of the semester, and also the place where I recommended that you place the feedback, the notes, the comments about the movies that we watched, uh, the TV series, etc. That's where your paper should be because I already have the link and already have a database with profiles for all the students, including where to find that. So that is where I will go after May 10th to retrieve a copy of the paper for my assessment, okay? And if you shared with me with editing rights, then I'll be able to leave my comments and the grade inside the file itself, okay? And with Google Docs, if you give me editing privileges, I can see the history of the paper. So I can see, I can see, I, I don't need to lock you out or uh, take any other extreme measures because I can see if someone has made changes to the paper past May 10th and what those changes were. That is to say, if you just saw a typo and you corrected it or you added a page, which would not be acceptable. On May 13th, we have the final exam at 8.30. I mentioned on another occasion talking about the final exam that we could use more than two hours uh, because we have a time slot that extends farther of about two hours and 45 minutes. However, I realized that it is very early in the morning and Yes, we could start at 8 or 8.15, but that, I'm oh, sorry, it's p.m. or is it a.m.? No, it's a.m. Cannot be p.m., right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll change that later. So just keep in mind, it's not p.m., it's a.m., in the a.m. So as I said, it's already difficult for students coming from the city, for example. So I'll keep it at 8.30. As you know, as I said before, you have four questions, you have five questions actually in the exams packet and you need to respond to four of those questions. Okay? Yes. Are we admit. typing your answers or are we writing them? You have to write them. I cannot allow you to use a computer or a tablet and I'll distribute blue books or pages with lines that I will collect at the end because what I do uh, after I correct the exams is I scan them and I send you back a PDF with my corrections and the grades so that you can see the exam. I've done that for a number of years because uh, otherwise students never come by to pick up the exams mm -hmm. and, and look not just at the grade but at any corrections. Yes? You said the final exam is going to be five questions? So you have to do yes, questions. exactly. No, no, five questions, you have to do just four. And as you remember, two of the questions are based on the prints, two of the questions are based on Machiavellian texts, such as the Nini Machiavelli or the New Machiavelli, etc., etc. One is based on the film or TV series. It's up to you to choose which four you'd rather answer, okay? Uh, so, this is AM, not PM. I'll correct it later, and I have, uh, Post it here and also in the syllabus the link to the app that allows you to um, schedule the or a presentation. I'll show it one more time for anyone who uh, came late. You find both in, well, actually, there are three places where you find the link. You find in the syllabus, in the calendar, in the announcements, a link that allows you to schedule your oral presentation. If that's your option, instead of sending a recorded video, that is the recommended option. 
Once you click on the link, you select oral presentations for CLT 362 or the other class. And from here, you can click on any of the available dates to see what times would be available. And you select one of those times, you have 20 minutes uh, sli uh, time slots, you select one of those, and then you have to enter your first, your last name, your Stony Brook email, and you will receive a message of confirmation. You will receive a reminder 24 hours before your presentation. As I said, after you've scheduled your presentation, if you want to cancel and reschedule, you can do that by clicking a link in the message you uh, get from the system. If you accidentally delete or lose that message, then you simply email me saying, I've reserved a new slot because that you can do. Please delete the other time slot that I had initially reserved and you specify which one because I would find myself with two in my agenda. I wouldn't know myself which one is the good one, which one you wanted removed or canceled. Okay. Any questions about this or about the presentation or about the exam since we're talking about this? And you know what it means. We're talking about scheduling a presentation for the paper, right? For the presentation based on the paper, it means that you need to start working, right? It doesn't mean that by the time of the presentation, you have to have the full paper ready. You need to have the core ideas though, the core example, the most convincing examples lined up, right? And then depending on how late you present, you may have to work on the rest, but this is the best approach to a paper. You don't start a paper from the first paragraph. Nobody writes an article or a book from the first paragraph. You start from a good example, a strong idea, and then you build your paper around that, okay? So if you haven't selected a book, start thinking about a book. If you don't have any particular preference, you can choose uh, some of the books that were presented, right? It, it would be okay to do your presentation on Harriet Rubin's Princessa or Stanley Bing's What Would Machiavelli Do? or uh, The 48 Laws of pa Power. Keep in mind that for those books, I provided excerpts, but you cannot do your paper on the excerpts. You have to get the book and you have to talk about other examples. You have to show that you have examined uh, the whole book and you've done some original work, not just rehash what I discussed, okay? If there are books you'd rather do your paper on that are not in the official list, just let me know because uh, there are plenty of other titles that would be acceptable or depending on your background, there might be books that are not directly inspired by Machiavelli which could be used regardless. And in that case, the starting point, the premise should be, you know this other book, or you're a history major and you would like to do a historical slash Machiavellian analysis of a leader, right? There are all, kind, all kinds of options that might fit your interests, in which case, contact me, send me a paragraph, justify your choice, let me know what's the general idea, what's the approach you would like to follow, and I'll tell you, mm, it, it might require too much work, or yes, go ahead and, and proceed, okay? Or tell me how you would make it manageable by restricting your focus, because this is not a dissertation and therefore you cannot write a paper on is Adolf Hitler Machiavellian or is the Mein, mein Kampf a Machiavellian book. Good <laughs> luck with that unless you've read it a couple of times already. Just, just to make you an example because I had a student in the past who uh, 
try to do that, but it's wow. such a complicated and confused book that it's not that easy at all to deal with such material, okay? Was that student okay? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, the paper was average. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you can survive even the reading of my comp, I guess. Any questions? Okay. And once again, if you want to be reminded of it, when you go in the sidebar, ideas for the paper is what I referred to earlier. And this is the list from which you can take any book. Although, keep in mind that there are vastly different books on this list. Some are kind of crappy, but it doesn't mean that you couldn't uh, write a paper. Sometimes a simplistic interpretation of Machiavelli is easier to unpack, right? It's easier to analyze because you don't necessarily have to like the book that you write about, not at all. Absolutely, it's just an intellectual analysis. So you can pick any from this list, or as I said, if you don't find something that you think could be a, a good material for uh, your paper, just let me know, but start working on this so that you can be ready for your presentation. Continue then. If there are no questions, but let me know. Uh, during other classes and uh, especially during the last week I'll try to reserve some time during the uh, classes on May to talk about your papers to talk again about your exam to see uh, if you need any assistance with that so I need to talk about a very famous play by Machiavelli called The Mandrake Root or The Mandrake. At this point, and on a Wednesday, exactly because I need, uh, because, because the, the Machiavellian book of this week and the next week, the new Machiavelli, requires some knowledge of this side of Machiavelli's production. Machiavelli was a famous playwright. His plays, he wrote a few plays, not too many, but his plays were staged multiple times in Florence, in other places. We have anecdotal evidence of the huge popularity of some of those plays. We know that uh, in places such as Venice, theaters were packed when Machiavelli's play were uh, performed. This particular play was staged for the first time in 1524. However, we have evidence from internal references that Machiavelli was working on the play in 1518 or 1519. And as you can see from the premise, the play is set in Florence in the year 1504, which would be during the time when Florence was under the government that was labeled the Republic of Florence. I, I need to work around the word Republic because it wasn't a democracy, right? It wasn't a Republican democracy. It was still an elitist organization, political organization of society, whereby basically the wealthiest members in Florence, namely the merchants, had access to power, could be elected or be appointed to a position in the government and participated in the various conversations, were active in the various forums where the politics of Florence was 
discuss. The placement has led some scholars to believe that the entire play could be some kind of allegory and an indirect satire of the Medici's taking power in Florence as they did in uh, 1512 later on. That is to say, by setting the play in 1504, Machiavelli would have masked his satire of the Medici, intentionally removing any potential reference for the average reader, whereby the inner circle, the people around Machiavelli, would have caught those hints, those inside jokes, so that Machiavelli could be shielded from any repercussion and at the same time play this kind of intellectual game with friends and people in the know. Before we talk about the plot of the play, we have to understand a few things about theater during the Renaissance Italian theater. It's not just Machiavelli, but the most successful playwrights used neo, used classical models, right? Especially in the case of theater, uh, the Latin models. In general, you know that Renaissance, which in Italian is Rinascimento, but in the uh, language of Italian Renaissance scholars is rinascita, means rebirth. And rebirth refers to the return of classical culture in all kinds of fields, from historiography to philology to uh, literature and theater. So, for example, one of the staples in the Latin models that inspired Machiavelli is the fact that the play should take place within 24 hours, right? Should come to a resolution. Aristotelian. Yes, based on Aristotle's uh, rules for theater. The kind of situation that moves the story ahead, which is not, of course, exactly uh, imitated by Machiavelli, but adapted then to the story, is of this kind. You can find a romantic dilemma whereby among the characters in the play, you find a couple of young lovers who, for some reason, social, political, related to family, cannot make their love public, and so the dilemma presented to the spectators is, will these very nice young lovers, so much in love, be eventually able to be happy together, to be together and, and celebrate their love? You can group within this place, you can group the secondary characters quite easily, you find the antagonists and you find the allies. So if the center of the play is a couple of young lovers, the antagonists would be any family members, the father primarily, who are opposed to the uh, love relationship between the two young lovers. And oftentimes it is a play after all, there is an ironic representation of the reasons why the antagonists are opposed to this relationship and usually there is a satire of people who are pedantic about social rules, who uh, stand for uh, the, the uh, upholding of rigid rules from the past, conventional customs and practices from the past and then they can see that uh, romantic love can break those social chains. The allies are people who will directly or indirectly help the two lovers. In the Latin plays, they're often slave servants. 
I've used both terms because the slave servant in Rome, you have to understand that in Roman society, slavery is an institution where you have an internal hierarchy. So there are different classes of slaves and the slave servant characters in these plays are very free. In fact, oftentimes they uh, are dominant uh, in their relationship with their masters. That is to say, they directly or indirectly control what their masters will do or should do. They're smarter or they're craftier. They see things in a more complex way. They see uh, so social relationships, family relationships in a different way. So they are instrumental often to the solution found for the celebration of this kind of love. And that's why I refer to hybrid social profiles because again, you can find a slave who is formally subject to the authority of the master and yet they've managed to gain enough freedom or more freedom than members of the family of the master. Okay. Even in classical theater, the strategy used to accomplish the happy conclusion to the play involve a lot of manipulation, including lies, false presuppositions. That is to say, there are misinformation that is used to uh, advance the cause of the young lovers, different kinds of persuasions. You find scenes in which someone is trying to persuade another characters. And of course, reconciliation after the fact, meaning that someone is forced to acknowledge a situation right, uh, ex post, uh, they have, they, 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 there is no coming back and they have to uh, adapt, okay? And there is a representation usually of situations that are at the edge of what is acceptable in society, okay? Of course, between classical theater and Machiavelli, there is also a whole genre that was very popular in Italian literature, so popular that it traveled abroad and reached France or even England. I'm talking about the kind of novellas, for example, that inspired Romeo and Juliet, right? That is based on an Italian novella. In the case of the Tuscan uh, subgenre, there are some recurring themes that help us understand Machiavelli's position a little better in this play. For example, starting from Boccaccio's The Cameron, which we use for Ciappelletto, right? Remember uh, the novella of Ciappelletto that I introduced at the beginning of the semester. There is a whole lot of stories where you find an affair, an extramarital affair, between a young wife and a young man in a situation where the young wife is married to an old man who is, of course, wealthy, influential, powerful, and therefore the marriage is clearly the result of a social alliance between the family of the young woman and the family of the man or of the old man or the old man himself. And the reason why this kind of social situation is emphasized in the novella is that clearly a novella that celebrates in a positive fashion an affair could be morally dangerous, risque as a reading, right? Because especially for literature of the past, you, you don't want to corrupt your reader. So what is the indirect moral justification for the celebration of what essentially is an affair is exactly to let the reader appreciate that the sin that uh, should be criticized is the social sin whereby a family will let uh, a young woman get married to an older man only for reasons of power, wealth, social prestige, social cloud. And in fact, within the context of these novellas, the affair is not a violation 
of moral and natural rules. The affair restores the natural balance of moral rules. Because the implication in these novellas is that young women should be married to young men because they have the same kind of natural libido. And if you let a young woman get married to an older man, clearly she'll have to satisfy her sexual desires with someone who is a better match from a biological standpoint, okay? Keep that in mind, keep in mind the moral implications and the complex reading that you have to apply. Then you have a long series of novellas based on pranks of a social nature, where someone is pranked, for example, into believing, so someone is a very awkward uh, man um, who, who cannot um, engage in a romantic courting relationship with a woman and they let this man believe that a, a, an incredibly beautiful uh, and seductive woman is in love with them only to make them aware of their shortcomings and limitation. Only because this prank, again, restores some kind at the end with a sometimes cruel conclusion, restores some kind of social equilibrium, which is considered to be also a natural equilibrium, whereby someone who pretended to be a great lover uh, or, or a Don Juan is pranked and will have to realize, and everyone around will realize, that they're not what they pretended to be. So the message, again, is, is not a, a simply following the conventional rules of morality. The message for this kind of novellas is make sure whatever identity you project in a public sphere, that that is really what you are. Because if you're not, the natural competition in society will put you back where you belong. So don't pretend to be more influential, more socially competent than you are, because the games played by society will make you realize that you're not such a powerful player, okay? So, what is the story in The Mandrake by Machiavelli? The Mandrake of the title is uh, the subject of pseudo-scientific books from the Middle Ages and also legends. The mandrake is an actual root, and the belief during the Middle Ages was that this root had some medicinal powers, of different kinds depending on the source. In the case of Machiavelli, the assumption is that the mandrake root will make a sterile woman fertile, will help a woman conceive a child. However, there is also in this tradition, pseudo-medical and legendary tradition, the belief that this root is poisonous, that whoever comes in contact with this plant, with this root, touching it, will uh, get intoxicated or even die. For example, you find manuscripts from the Middle Ages with representations where you see a dog and uh, the, there is a, a rope tied to the dog, the rope is tied to the mandrake root and the dog is employed to uproot the plant without uh, intoxicating or, or poisoning the collector of the plant. Once the plant is uprooted, then the, the poisonous nature of the plant is always temporary in these legends. So at some point you can manipulate, you can touch it, and you can prepare some kind of concoction, okay? Keep in mind this legendary kind of knowledge about the mandrake. In the story by Machiavelli, at the very beginning, we find Callimaco, who's a, a young student, frankly, an unproductive member of society, right? Because he went to Paris to study. He doesn't have a degree. He's back in Florence. And 
He's wealthy enough to have a servant, doesn't have really to work, and uh, he's not very preoccupied with his studies. His principal preoccupation at the beginning of the story is that he is in love with Lucrezia, a young woman, beautiful woman, who's married to Messer Nietzsche, the old man of the stereotypical situation I alluded to earlier. So, Callimaco wants to have sex with Lucrezia, right? But apparently there is no way to achieve that because Lucrezia is a virtuous wife, a loyal wife, loyal to her husband, uh, and apparently also loyal to social rules and religious rules uh, predicated on uh, the, the uh, faithful uh, relationship between husband and wife. So he, he cannot just approach Lucrezia and say, I'm, I'm more handsome than your husband, I'm more virile than your husband, have sex with me, have a sexual affair with me. That is out of the question. So a plan has to be devised. As I said before, in this case, the allies, those who will support the execution of the plan, are a servant, obviously, right, but in Florence, a crafty servant, very quick to adapt to different kinds of situation, called Ciro, and another interesting social character by the name of Ligurio, who's essentially a parasite or a hustler, right? Trying to make money uh, off of other people with his smarts. So with their help, they come up with this plan. Since Kalimaco was a student in Paris and Paris had one of the best known universities in Europe, Messer Nietzsche is led to believe that Kalimaco is a doctor. Messer Nietzsche has a problem. He's married to Lucrezia, has been married to Lucrezia for a while, but they don't have a child, they don't have a heir, which is normal, right? Because he's too old to have a child. They tell him that by using this powerful plant, the mandrake, they can help Lucrezia conceive a child. However, they tell him that the mandrake is poisonous. So after Lucrezia has drank from, uh, drank this potion made of uh, mandrake from the mandrake root, the first man who has sex with her will die, will absorb the poison. Why is Lucrezia not dying? Because of course, women are part of the magic tradition. Women are biologically different. There is a lot of stories about the magical powers of women or about the interference that women uh, uh, play in magical situations. That is to say that uh, women in some stories have the power to diffuse the effects of magic. Okay, fine. And, and it's a comedy, right? So the, re the, the spectators or the readers understand the knowledge that is being that, that this is based on, and that is the target of the humor in, in the novel. So how do, you, how do you go about this, right? If Messer Nietzsche cannot have sex with her wife without dying, the idea put forth by uh, the allies to Kalimaco, Kalimaco is being introduced as the doctor, so he plays a part in that as well, is that they need to take someone, kidnap this person, a stranger, put it, put the stranger in Lucrezia's bed, force them to have sex. The poor schmuck will be put out in the streets again, not knowing that he will die in a matter of hours. After that, Nietzsche will be allowed to safely have, engage in sexual activities with his wife and his wife will become pregnant right away, okay? Of course, what is the plan? That the night when they go out to kidnap a stranger and put it in Lucrezia's bed, Kalimaco will be that stranger, right, with some kind of disguise, and that he will end up in Lucrezia's bed 
which is what he wanted from the very beginning. What about Lucrezia herself? Because as I said before, Lucrezia is a virtuous woman, appears to be also very devout, although it's not sure, it's not clear whether this is part of a ploy or she's just truly a believer. Lucrezia is convinced, is persuaded by her mother and her mother, who's interested in keeping this marriage, because from the very beginning, this marriage is about strengthening the ties between two families, making Lucrezia's family more powerful by virtue of association with the wealthy old man, Messer Nietzsche, and a corrupt friar who, in exchange for money, will persuade Lucrezia that this is God's will, that God wants her to have a child, and if this is the only way, then there is a moral necessity to it, Lucrezia will be persuaded to accept this. At the end of the play, Lucrezia and Callimaco will be in Lucrezia's bedroom. However, Callimaco will stop before engaging in the sexual act and will come clean, will say, listen, this is all it was. I'm not uh, the stranger who will die. This was part of a plan. And he makes it clear that they're both beautiful. They're both uh, uh, in their sexual prime and they can enjoy each other, okay? So he explains the reasons why, not the moral reasons, but the natural reasons why this should happen. Lucrezia agrees to this, they have sex that night, and of course, Callimaco will become, um, playing the part of the, the doctor with a degree from the French university, will become part of the family, will frequent Messer Nietzsche and Lucrezia, and this sexual affair, this sexual relationship, will continue on after that first night uh, to their mutual satisfaction. Okay, so what are the lessons that we can draw from this? For that, you will have to wait another time because we only have a couple of minutes. So make sure that you sign the attendance which is going around but has not reached the last row yet. So before you leave the class, make sure you sign it and someone please return it to the table here. And I will continue another time. Okay, thank you for your patience. Let me know if you have any questions. Again, if you uh, were late in the first part of the class, I introduced the app and the link that will allow you to schedule your oral presentation. And you can review the video if you missed it. Uh, this afternoon after the YouTube video of this class will be posted.